welcome Sarah Kleiner, carnivore yogi to the show. Thank you so much for doing this slightly pushed back because life is crazy for both of us. It worked out. I'm so glad that it worked out. Can you do me a favor and just start off with telling your story of how you became, why you became a carnivore, what you were looking for when you came to this way of eating and just we'll go from there. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's a lot that I was on a health journey kind of already. I've been on a health journey for many years now um, and was vegan for a couple of years. That didn't really work out so well for me. I have been teaching yoga for over 12 years now and practicing yoga for longer than that. And so yoga was, it is a huge part of my life. And I had gotten to the point where I was having so much joint pain and inflammation that I wasn't really able to practice yoga the way that I wanted to. It was just painful. I also, you know, was starting to just, I already had a lot of IBS and a lot of issues with my stomach, a lot of bloating, a lot of gas, and just was reacting to like everything that was like healthy. All the healthy foods were making me sicker and sicker. And I was just frustrated. And so a friend of mine, um, Dr. Remka, I don't know if you've heard of her. She actually lives just a couple miles away from her. We've been friends for years. She, I was sending her my labs and I was like, I just don't know what to do. And she said, you know, I could take you on as a patient. It would cost a lot of money. We could do a lot of things, but why don't you try carnivore first? Because she had been doing it at the time about five months. And I was like, you're completely flipping insane. Like just eat meat. Like, like that's crazy. Um, and, but I had gotten to a desperation point. So I said, all right, I'm going to try this. And within just about two or three weeks, I was back to my yoga practice, practicing like pain-free, um, all the bloating gas indigestion, like huge distended belly. Every time after I ate that was gone. Um, and I was originally just going to do it for, a 30 day stint and that was going to be it. And then it ended up turning into, you know, my lifestyle and, uh, living an animal-based lifestyle still to this day, three years later, and just truly believing in the healing power of animal foods, um, as a basis of our diet. And so that's really how I got into carnivore. I started my page as a joke <laughs> because I was, you know, it was like once I was back in the yoga room practicing, I was looking around and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's like most of the people in this room are like vegan or vegetarian. Cause we would do at this, the shala I used to practice at, I used to do Ashtanga yoga. They would have like vegan potlucks all the time. And so we'd have like Sunday morning practice and then everyone would bring like a vegan dish and we hang out and like vegan potluck was like the thing that they did. And so I'm like sitting there practicing with everyone. I'm thinking, what if I started an Instagram page called carnivore yogi? Like how funny would that be? Like, so I started it as a joke and then I started getting a lot of people following me and it caught on. And then I made friends with a lot of people um, in the carnivore community. And it just has kind of grown and evolved through there. Now I do, I'm a certified nutrition coach. Um, I do consultations with people and have a podcast and a YouTube and an Instagram. It's like my full-time job now, which is pretty cool, but it was not something that I went into purposefully <laughs> that way, thinking it was going to turn into this. So it's been, a, it's been a wild ride for sure. And it's life altering in a way that you don't expect. Yeah, definitely. You wouldn't think that animal products could have such a huge impact on your health. I've heard so many stories of people who were vegan for whatever reason, and then have now come over to carnivore, uh, most mm -hmm. of it for health reasons. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And so that, um, that is one consistent thing that I've been hearing, especially recently. Now, what about your family? What does the rest of your family eat? I would call them like keto paleo. Honestly, I will make, um, a side dishes for them uh, low anti-nutrient vegetables and, you know, not really high sugar fruits. So if they're going to eat fruit, especially my husband, I try to just get apples and berries and, you know, just, I would call them more paleo than, than anything, honestly. So it's, it's easy because you just cook a lot of meat and they're, they're The meat is the centerpiece of all of our meals, regardless 
it's the meat is always essential and it's the centerpiece. So I'm always going to be cooking that anyway. Um, so I do sides for them and yeah, it's, it's not as hard as you would think it is. It's pretty easy. Oh, I completely agree. Yeah. We have low carb keto kids as well. Yeah. Um, and the older ones, I'll let them have like potatoes, Mm -hmm. uh, every once in a while they can handle it. The young ones still bounce off the walls with the Mm -hmm. potatoes and can't sleep very well. So it's like, well, we'll, we'll try it sometime when you're older. Um, but we, we do the same thing. We try to focus on the non-processed foods. Oh yeah. Um, We don't do anything in a box or a can or a package here. Like that's the rule. It does not come in the house if it's a package or can or, or no, we don't do it. Yeah. Which is so refreshing because the keto products. Oh yeah. No. Mm -mm. Oh they are just there. It's such a lie and it's such Mm -hmm. a trap and they just want to get into your pocket, get into your money. And, uh, and they, they don't have your best health interest in mind either. No, all of these companies, they, they, they have their bottom line to look out for. And so I, I have so many people that I work with that they're like, Oh, well, I bought this keto bread. And I'm like, Mm -mm. no, (laughs) turn it Mm -mm. over. Let's go over the ingredients together let's look at it and see what you think. Um, because it's just, it's, it's just all a lie. Oh my gosh. So I know that in your own personal journey, you have had to play around with fat to protein macros. Mm -hmm. And right now there's a huge movement for protein sparing, modified fasting. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people that really, really hope that it's for absolutely everybody. And they think that it doesn't matter, you know, and, and, So can you tell me a little bit about your journey, finding your sweet spot with protein to fat macros, um, for you personally, because everyone wants to know where everyone is and, you know, it's like one size does not fit all, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I first started carnivore, I was, I was still afraid of fat, honestly. And I didn't. I tried not to eat a lot of fat and I know a lot of other women had the same experience that they get a fatty steak and then they're still like pushing the fat to the side and just eating the meat. And I definitely did that for the first year and, uh, it eventually, and it happens quicker for some people than it does for others, but eventually I lost my cycle. Um, eventually I started having issues with sleep. So I would just wake up all the time and I couldn't fall asleep. And so I started having issues with my cortisol. I think that was also electrolyte related. Um, and I started having gut issues also. And I was like, I thought I got rid of these. Why are they back? Um, and so I had to kind of swing completely the other way and go super high fat and take the protein back, like take the actually limit the amount of protein that I was eating, which I mean, if I talk, whenever I talk about this on my, like even last night, I got some guy trolling one of my videos that I was saying, if you eat too much protein, then um, you may not get into ketosis. Oh, wow. Scary. Um, And he was freaking out and saying, I was like putting misinformation out and you shouldn't even be making videos and like, what's the point? And I'm just like, dude, I have worked with hundreds of people at this point and talked with thousands of people at this point. I have a platform where I communicate all the time with my viewers, with people that, I mean, this like, they're my friends. I talk with people all the time, every day. And I was, I didn't go off on the guy. I was just like, perhaps my channel is not for you. Perhaps you shouldn't watch my channel if you disagree so harshly, just find something else to watch, dude. But seriously, if you're, if ketosis is the goal, which for me, it had to become the goal because my body was not really running on, um, carbs, but not really running on fat. And I was in this kind of in-between state constantly. It was never fat burning and it was never carb burning that it just literally became very stressful for my body to handle. And so once I switched the, the ratios around and did really high fat and moderated my protein, I got my cycle back within two weeks. Um, everything regulated. I felt better. I did gain some weight. Um, I, I did gain weight, and uh, but I got into really you know high level of ketosis, and a lot of things got better for me. Now where I'm at a year later is not so much emphasis on 
the protein fat and freaking out and tracking every little, you know, like super high fat or whatever. I am more like looking at my lifestyle as a whole. Right. So if someone's like, what's your ratio of protein? If I don't really know, like now I am more intuitive with it. I don't, I definitely don't eat as much fat as I did a year ago. I've taken it down a little bit, but I eat enough fat so that my hormones are very regulated, um, that I don't miss my cycle and I don't have PMS and everything is working really well. I just had my hormone panels run a couple months ago. And my doctor was like, what are you doing? Because you're at 42, this looks like somebody in their early to mid thirties, like your hormone levels, your um, AMH and all this, you know, stuff that's supposed to decline rapidly in your forties is like, she was like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't really think you want to know, but (laughs) I can tell you, but um, so now, yeah, like if I had to track and look, I'm probably eating, you know, maybe like 70, 70, 75, 80% fat and the rest, you know, protein. And yeah, it's, but I'm not like sitting there tracking it. Like I used to, um, because once you do it for a while, once your body gets used to burning fat for fuel, you don't have to be as stringent as you were when you first started it. So there's a little more wiggle room after a little while, which is where I'm at now. Yeah. And there's so many people, our bodies are so different. Mm -hmm. We are all human, but there are some people who thrive on super high levels of protein and very, very little fat. Right. And if that's who you are, there are absolutely people in this space, go follow them. Right. And I, I really want to try with my channel to bring to light all aspects and point people in the right direction, because if they're Mm -hmm. having problems with their hormones and like you lost your cycle on carnivore, a lot of people think that that's completely impossible. No, it happens to lots and lots and lots and lots. Can I say lots of women? Just one more lots. (laughs) Because I get the emails, I get the direct messages and people are like, no, that doesn't ever happen. I'm like, I can literally show you my inbox full of emails from women and my DMs full of emails from women who have lost their cycle on carnivore. Yeah, it happens. It does. Yeah. There's a, there's a subset of people who can be vegan and thrive. Mm -hmm. And I think that genetics has a lot to do with it. There is a subset of people who can be super high protein and thrive. Then there's those of us who need to be much higher in fat. Mm-hmm. to be able to do better. My mental state. Oh God. Yeah. Forget relies it. Relies <laughs> solely on how much fat I get. I, yeah. I can do the protein sparing maybe one day a week. Right. That's what but, I'm saying. If you're going to do it like one or two days a week. Yeah. Max, and that's for, and that for someone like on, me. Yeah. And that depends on how much weight you have to lose. Right. The only way you should be using is if you still have quite a bit of weight to lose, but it was like, I wanted to try it and see what would happen. Oh, by the second time during the week, you know, not even every day, but every other day. Oh, I was angry and yeah. grumpy. And my kids and my husband were like, please go mm-hmm. eat some cheese or something. <laughs> they were yeah. like, anything. You're doing some butter. There's some tallow in the door. Go get something because it it's rough. So I don't want anyone to think that just because one person says this is the way to do it, that they're right. Right you have to look around and you have to check in with your own body, which is what you obviously spent, you know, quite a bit of time doing is checking your hormones to see what do I need to do and altering to get your cycle back. Um, So how important do you think it is for people to check in with their levels, their blood levels and things like that? I mean, I think you have to go by your symptoms first. If you're not having a, a regular cycle, right. And you're not like menopausal, If you're, I mean, even if you're in your late thirties, early forties, that's too early for you to be hitting menopause. Most people, it's going to be too early. So if that starts happening, then you might want to check in. Um, If you're having symptoms, if you're not sleeping, right, you may want to check in, get some lab work done to see what's going on. I think it's important if you're having symptoms that are um, altering your life in any way, you should definitely get get blood work drawn. And I think we should all know what our fasting um, blood sugar is. We should know what our A1C is, which is an average, you know, three month average of your blood sugar. You need to know those things uh, because 
that's your metabolic health, which is why we all do this in the first place. You know, most of us, <laughs> I'm not doing it for any kind of awards or like accolades. I'm doing it because of my metabolic health and I want to keep my health in a really good place long-term. So when I am older, I don't die of like some awful, like long, awful disease. Like I just maybe like fall off of a roof and die that way, you know, like <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'd rather, I'd rather go quickly than have like a, I've had so many relatives that just have an agonizing last 20, you know, 15, 20 years, just miserable. Um, and I don't want that if I can prevent it. So that's why I'm doing this is not for accolades or an award it's metabolic health. And so knowing your A1C and, uh, you know, fasting blood glucose, those types of things I think are important for people just to find out if what you're doing actually is in fact working for you. Yeah. We are living longer as the human race, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're living better. Exactly. And so I'm, I'm with you 100%. I want to live my best life and I want it to maintain as long as possible. Hopefully <laughs> I'm not dancing on the roof at the age of 80 something, but you know, who knows where we're going to be. You then. never know. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Fiddler on the roof. It's a new, right. It's a new trend. Um, and the other thing I really want to try to hit home with a lot of people is no matter where you are in your journey, on your path to weight loss, to mental health, to whatever it is that you are going for, that you are trying to attain, to be happy with your body mm -hmm. where it is and loving yourself where you are on your journey. Because if you keep thinking, oh, I'm going to love myself when I weigh this much, mm -hmm or when I wear this size, or when I attain this goal, if you can't love yourself where you are, then there's no guarantee you're going to love yourself then either. Right. Definitely not. And I remember listening to you. It was a while ago. It was, oh gosh, it was a while, a while ago. And you were like, look, I upped the fat. I'm feeling so much better. And guess what? I've gained weight and I'm happy about it. Yeah. And that is one thing that I really want people to see. We gain weight on this diet. Mm -hmm. If our bodies need to gain weight and right. it's not a bad thing. The, the scale is literally one of your worst enemies. Mm -hmm. And there are so many other things to go by, like your mental health mm -hmm. and keeping up with your children yeah. and things like that. And so that is where I really want people to focus. So what do you have to say? What advice do you have for people on loving themselves where they are while they are going through this. Yeah. I mean, I think you have to keep your end goal in mind and understand that sometimes your body, if you've been restricting for a really long time, or you've been afraid of eating fat and you've been undernourished and all of that stuff, then there might be a little swing there, but it's not going to be permanent and keep that vision in your mind of health, keep those long-term goals in your mind and, um, just take it one day at a time and know that, you know, nothing in life lasts forever. Nothing's permanent. And, you know, now I've lost all the weight that I gained and then some, and it's, it just, it's, yeah, I, it's, it's going to be okay. It's not, it doesn't define you when you gain the weight. It really doesn't, it doesn't change who you are. Yeah. It's just a number on the scale. Um, ask nurse Cindy is always like, it's a lying scale. You got to get off of it and pay attention mm -hmm. to other things that are so much more important. Um, your, your health and your mental well being is so much more important. Definitely. And dancing on the roof when you're 80 again, exactly way more important. So there is one random question that I ask everyone that comes onto my show. And that is, do you drink coffee and how do you take it? I actually quit drinking coffee in February. Um, so yeah, no, I don't drink it anymore. But when I did drink coffee, I mostly just drank it black. Mm -hmm. Why did you cut out coffee? I just felt that it was interfering with my sleep and I wanted to see how I would feel without it. I felt like I was addicted to it, that I couldn't live without it, you know, that I had to have it every day and that I was waking up and going straight to the coffee maker. Um, and I just didn't like that feeling of like dependence for my energy on coffee. And so I decided I was going to cut it out. It was kind of a longer process because I went really slowly 
And um, yeah, I feel a lot better without it. I have a lot more natural energy. I don't have as many electrolyte issues because it is dehydrating. And uh, yeah, I don't really miss it that much, to be honest with you, now that it's been gone for a while. Yep. That's one of the reasons I asked this question is I, as I want people to look at things of, oh, I'm going through the same thing. Maybe I should try cutting out the coffee because it is just water that touched the beans. Yep. And for some people it's great and they're fine with it. And for other people, they're not. And checking in and being honest with yourself is, is one of those tough things. I cut out coffee not too long ago for a couple months and then brought it back in to see if there was a whole lot of changes and there really wasn't. I can go with it. I can go without it. It doesn't matter. And so right now my husband and I are drinking coffee again for now. We'll see how long we keep it. When it starts causing some problems, then we will probably cut it out. But uh, I think that is, that's pretty much all the questions that I had for you. So thank you so much for coming on and just having a quick chat. I know you have a very busy schedule and I have a busy schedule. And so this was wonderful to just touch base real quick. Just